uh, discussing high school astronomy in the digital age, and rounding it off with Dennis Gray with upgrade options for Schmidt Kastrin Telescope. And then I'll be back with the announcements. So let's get started with Chris Vaughn and the sky this month. Thornhill, Ontario, which is just down the road from the David Dunlap Observatory. So I'm going to go through the uh, the, the events for the coming five weeks, roughly, starting tonight. And uh, there's quite a bit of interesting things to look at. The only downside is our nights are short. Am I good to go? All right. First up, a little bit of news in space exploration. Lost space launches are becoming uh, commonplace nowadays, but I did pick out a few of the more interesting ones that uh, folks can maybe uh, be attuned to or pay, pay attention to. Uh, sometime early in June, the Chinese will launch their Long March rocket um, with three Chinese astronauts heading up to the International Space Station. Then on June 6th, around 5.20 in the morning, um, Rocket Labs, who launched from uh, New Zealand, will be launching their capstone mission. This is the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. And what they're going to do is they're going to put a spacecraft into the same orbit that will be used by NASA's Gateway Space, Gateway Space Station around the moon. So this is a, a really interesting mission. Uh, sometime this month, we're expecting SpaceX to launch uh, their super heavy Starship into an, orbit, an Earth orbital test. Uh, they'll attempt to orbit the Earth and splash down near Hawaii. And then finally, uh, Chinese are back at it again sometime in July with a Long March rocket um, launching the second component to their, their building, you know, their growing uh, Chinese space station. So it'll, it'll, they'll enlarge their space station a little bit with that launch. Uh, before I dip into observing, just take a minute to appreciate this fantastic uh, Star Trails image taken by uh, Bill Longo, who many of us know. Uh, on May 31st in, the, in the, the morning, he was up looking for the Tau Hercules and picked up uh, a number of green firefly trails in addition to a few meteors. So if you're interested in helping uh, contribute to science and monitoring the effects of uh, the growing effects of light pollution around the world, you can participate in the Globe at Night project. And this is a, a group that collects uh, observations of folks' local night sky. So essentially, um, during the uh, period in question, so in this case, June 19th to 28th, um, they're asking everyone to head out and look at the constellation of Hercules. And then using some um, comparison charts that they provide for you, you can then determine just how faint the stars are that you can see from your location. And then you submit the results and over time this gets accumulated into light pollution maps, uh, both in, you know, in, in, in X and Y, the regional map, but also the, the change over time. So that additional dimension of information. Um, in terms of the sun, right now I do encourage folks to take a look at the sun if they've got safe solar observing equipment. Uh, white light, safe white light filters or uh, solar telescopes. The sun is in, in an upswing in its activity. We're entering a new, um, uh, building up to a new maximum. So do 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 to that if you have a chance. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at about 15 hours and 14 minutes of daylight. Of course, we're the sky this month. This session is going to sit squarely on top of the, the solstice, which happens on June 21st at 514 in the morning. So we've got uh, days uh, growing a little bit longer until the 21st and then gradually shortening a little bit um, by the time of our next meeting on July 6th. But basically, we're looking at 15 and a quarter hours of daylight and the corresponding short night periods. We also uh, get Earth at Aphelion or its farthest distance from the sun. That'll occur um, next month on July 4th. So in terms of when the sky is dark after sunset or before sunrise, we deal with the concept of astronomical twilight. An astronomical twilight is the period when the sun is between 12 and 18 degrees below the horizon. Once it gets more than 18 degrees below the horizon, we consider the sky is gonna be, is as dark as it's going to get. And that's the block of time when the imagers are really interested in um, doing all their, their data gathering and so on. And uh, of course, if you wanna start your stargazing, your, your telescope observing, 
you know, you can get into that during the, the astronomical twilight period, but really the imaging is, um, is when you want to begin that. Uh, unfortunately, because of those long daylight times, we have short nights. So we've only got four hours and 14 minutes of imaging. The astronomical twilight period ends at 11.08 tonight and resumes at 3.22 a.m. tomorrow morning. And then five weeks from now at our next meeting, um, we're still only at four hours and six minutes of imaging time because of astronomical twilight beginning, uh, ending at 11.19 and resuming at uh, 3.25 in the morning. Uh, speaking of the moon, so these are the perigee and apogee dates when the moon is closest and farthest. The uh, perigee comes into play here because uh, the June 14th full moon, the full strawberry moon, will be a supermoon. So this supermoon is defined to be a moon that's full at the same time as it's say within 90 percent of its closest distance to the earth or perigee and this super moon the, the moon will be full about 13 hours before the perigee which allows those to sync up and give you that super moon effect of course the super moon in the sky will only be a few percent larger and a few percent brighter than average it's not something that most people would notice it's a bit like uh, comparing the size of a loony and a toony held at arm's length so a little bit bigger but uh, you probably won't notice if you weren't aware of it um, of course, the first first quarter moon will happen on June seventh. So on so on Tuesday, uh, then we've got the full moon, and our best dark sky observing period happens between the third quarter and new moon period. It's around a little more than a week, so about um, say nine or ten days worth before the moon gets too much of a bother in the evening sky again, and that's going to run from June twentieth uh, to June twenty eighth. Now, something interesting is that a few times a year when the sun is at a particular angle as it's rising over the lunar uh, lunar horizon, uh, we get the effect of the lunar X and the lunar V, and in some cases, the lunar L, and of course, craters are O, so you can make uh, all kinds of letters on the moon if you want. Um, so that's happening this month, and that will happen at on June 6th, so Monday, June 6th, but it's going to be in daytime for us here in the GTA. It's going to peak. The lunar X will form start forming around 5 p.m eastern time peak around 6 30 and then take another hour hour and a half to to um to dissipate or fade away again and so that's going to be actually in a daytime sky now you can look at the moon in your telescope or binoculars in a daytime sky one tip that you can try using is wearing polarized glasses even the uh, 3d glasses from the movies will increase the contrast in a daytime sky, darken the sky and, and, and brighten the moon. So that's something you can try. Uh, if you're, uh, the V is up here. So the X is down here just below the lunar uh, equator. That's about, uh, I think it's about 21 degrees south lunar uh, latitude. The lunar V is up along the terminator in the sort of the north 40, 45 uh, degree zone. And then the L is down here kind of down here near this sort of Mickey Mouse trio of craters that form Mickey Mouse's face. So you can look for the L just a little bit to the south of that. Um, if you're interested in finding out uh, more details about the moon's phases, I, I highly recommend this website. It's a NASA tool that's online. It's called the uh, Lunar Libration and Phase Tool. And what you can do is you can dial up the moon at any hour of any day of the year for 2022. When we get to 2023, they'll upload a fresh one. And if you click on any of those hours, you can then get a visualization of the moon's phases in detail. And if you click on that, that image itself, it'll download a, a detailed, a, a very high res um, tile or, or image that you can see here underneath here, which gives a lot more details about the moon at that particular hour, including some annotations. And there's also a version of that uh, link for Newtonian telescopes where the moon is flipped upside down if you want with something that will match your eyepiece view. I've uh, got a couple of comments and uh, in, a, in a minute or two, I'm going to switch over to Stellarium and show you a kind of a live view of some of these, but two comments to look out for um, in the next little bit is Comet C2017 K2 Panstars. And that comet is observable all night long in the constellation of Ophiuchus, which is kind of in the southern sky in evening. It's at magnitude nine and a half and brightening. So really it's a, you know, it's a, it's a backyard telescope or, or, or bigger telescope object if you can get to, um, especially if you can get to a dark site. Uh, a couple of neat things is on June 19th and 20th. So it's traveling uh, west through Ophiuchus. 
And on the 19th and 20th, it's going to pass just on the southern outreaches of this open cluster IC4665, nicknamed the Summer Beehive Cluster. Fairly big, fairly big open cluster. And then the next night, next couple of nights, it's going to pass very close to the bright star Sabal Rai in, in Ophiuchus. So that would be a good way to, um, to figure out that you're in the right location. Uh, the other comet there to keep an eye out for is Comet C2021P4 Atlas. It's in the northwestern sky right after dusk, so it's not as favorable or, or nicely placed as the previous one. But it's going to spend the month uh, traveling along the body of Lynx, so traveling uh, uh, west to east across the constellation. It's a bit dimmer. It's magnitude 11. It's still in the process of brightening. Um, it's going to pass on July 5th uh, the UFO galaxy, NGC 2683, which is a potential imaging, um, imaging uh, night for that. And again, I can show you where those are in Stellarium here in a minute. If you're interested in watching the space station fly overhead, um, the International Space Station series of passes is ending tomorrow, and then it won't return until it returns in the pre-dawn on June 26th. And when it does that, I've got a couple of extremely bright passes noted here on the 27th and the 30th. It's just the times that uh, won't, they won't get me out of bed. But uh, if anybody is really keen, um, you can get up early and, and see the space station. Or just wait another few weeks or a month and it'll be back in the evening sky again. Uh, for those interested in the Chinese, Chinese space station, um, it will resume pre-dawn passes on June 10th. And, you know, there may be some, uh, it's much dimmer than the ISS. It's magnitude plus one as opposed to minus 3.7. So it's quite a bit dimmer. But you can certainly see it. And uh, once they do launch that additional module, that might be something to keep an eye out for to see if you can see both pieces or the resulting brighter um, piece when it's when it's assembled together. Uh, June 12th at 10.15 p.m., the nearly full moon will occult the magnitude 2.35 star, double star, Deshaba. Deshaba is one of the claws of Scorpius, so Delta Scorpii. Um, the dark, the dark, barely dark, so it's a very thin dark edge of the moon. It's nearly full at that point, but the dark edge of the moon will cover the two stars at 10.14.40 in the GTA. And then the stars will reappear at about 1055 26 and what's neat is because this is a double star and they've got a little separation that the, they'll wink out one at a time about eight seconds apart so not that eight seconds doesn't refer to the distance apart from the stars it refers to the delay time in the moon hiding and then revealing the stars again an eight second delay so that's kind of a fun one to look for um, if you're interested in looking at variable stars uh, one of the ones you can take note of at this time of the year and deeper into the summer as we go is Sheliac, also known as Beta Lyrae. And Sheliac, if you think of the star Vega, which would be up here out of the out of the view, and then the parallelogram of the constellation of Lyra, and Sheliac is the star in the sort of western uh, northwestern corner of the parallelogram. Um, it's a it's an eclipsing binary system, so we have two stars, one orbiting the other. And because the orbits are not edge on to the Earth, then we don't have an in, we don't have a full eclipse happening. We have um, always some of the two stars, some of each of the two stars in sight, and so you do get a um, a dual a dual lobe or, or double dip in this uh, in this in this brightness variation. So it varies by um, a full magnitude. So that's about a factor of two in brightness over 12.94 days. So when you head outside. You can take a look at Sheliac and compare it right away. Does how does it compare with Delta? If it says if it's the same as Delta on the opposite, then it's at its minimum. If it's the same as Silifat at the bottom of the parallelogram, then it's near its maximum. So you can instantly do your own variable star observing just with your unaided eyes, which is a fun one. All right, let's switch over and do some Stellarium here. So the Moon is going to um, to do a, a number of really cool things this month because it's going to be paying a lot of visits to a lot of celestial objects. So first of all, tonight, if you happen to be out before it's dark, you can take a look for the young crescent moon shining in the western northwestern sky, just to the right of the bright star Mebsuta in Gemini. And then if you're, you've got binoculars, I'll put up a ring for binoculars here so we can see this workings. This six degree ring is about binoculars ring. So the 
the asteroid series or dwarf planet, formerly asteroid series, will be shining a little bit to the lower right of the moon, magnitude 8.9. So, you know, it's not going to be an easy thing to see in, in the twilight. By the time the sky is dark, they'll be getting kind of low, but you know, it's something that you may want to take a look and see if you can see. Then as we head a little bit deeper into the, the month, so we're going to get the moon passing close to the beehive star cluster in Cancer around the third of the month. And through the evening, um, the moon will move a little bit closer to the cluster. I'll just bring up the deep sky symbols here where you can see the, the beehive cluster. And again, these will kind of fit together in, in your binoculars, but really, if you want to see the bees the best amount, um, just stick the moon outside the field of view a little bit, just so its brightness isn't uh, dominating your, your binoculars field of view. Now we're going to jump way ahead to the next interesting event that the moon is going to get up to around by this point we're going to get into deep in the evening all right so towards the 18th of the month we're going to see the moon do its monthly pass by all the morning planets so all the morning planets are visible in the am all the bright planets are in the am right now let me just wind back here so everybody can see the sky around five in the morning so here's the the eastern sky around five in the clock in the morning you've got venus so saturn rises first around just after midnight and saturn will soon will soon join the evening sky it'll soon be rising before midnight before the end of june a little while after that, we get very bright Jupiter joining the party and then Mars. If you're paying attention to um, Mars and Jupiter over the next little bit, if you're up early the next few mornings, we're going to see Mars and Jupiter much closer together and Mars's faster speed is going to be increasing its distance, increasing its separation from Jupiter all through the month here. And then we've got Venus rising a little bit later, so we're creating this nice long chain of planets that are defining the plane of our solar system. And then Mercury pops its head up. Last of all, Mercury is going to be increasing its separation until about, I can see under here. So we've got Mercury at maximum elongation around the 16th of the month. So that'll be your sort of best time to see Mercury, although not a good, particularly good operation for us in the GTA because Mercury is well south of this tipped over morning ecliptic. Well, that's something you can uh, put on your calendars for around the 16th of the month. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy on the 16th, the you know several mornings around that date will be nearly as good. Um, as I said, in the meantime, we've got the moon starting to visit all these planets. So back here, we had the moon on the 18th coming in. Here's the moon down here on the 18th. And a number of photo ops, so you can get a couple of days later, you've got Jupiter and the moon. And if you want to get up a little bit early, you can get some stars around them and, uh, and a bit of a nicer view. Then on the 22nd, the moon will sit below and between Jupiter and Mars. And we march a bit further along. The moon is actually going to pass Uranus. Now, Uranus is not going to be particularly visible for us because it's sort of in this morning twilight and it, you can get up a little earlier and it will be in a darker sky. But it, it, what is interesting is that the moon will actually occult Uranus for parts of the world, not, not visible around here. Then we get to the 25th or so, 26th. We've got a really nice photo op of the old crescent moon shining above the horizon. If you can get yourself positioned in a nice spot with some nice scenery in the foreground, get a really pretty picture of the moon shining next to Venus. And then I'm just gonna bring this up a little higher. We get the moon finally visiting Mercury to end the month. Again, not a particularly easy one to see with the moon and Mercury in the twilight, but um, you know, just for completeness, I'll mention that. Uh, another interesting thing is, is back to Venus for a second. So Venus is actually going to pass binocular or pass telescope close to uranus let me just bring that up for you to see oh and by the way when you're when you're viewing uh the moon and venus on the 26th don't forget to see if you can check out the the pleiades the pleiades will be gleaming 
in the twilight. And when you look at the Pleiades during a twilight sky, that's when you truly do see the seven stars of the seven sisters. If you see the Pleiades in a nighttime sky, it can be a little confusing where anybody came up with the idea of seven, but I found when I see it in the twilight that it's really, um, really there. All right, so put Venus here in the center and go back a little bit. And what we're gonna get is Venus is gonna encounter Uranus. So Venus is moving sunward fairly rapidly. It'll, it'll hang around in the Eastern sky uh, for a while yet, but if you, I know it's low, but these two will be um, actually about 1.7 degrees apart. So just able to fit together in the eyepiece of a low power telescope uh, for a couple mornings. All right, so let's see what else we've got here. All right, so back to, let's go back to tonight and bring up the southern sky here. So when you're looking at, uh, let's mention some uh, suggestions for deep sky observing. Uh, one of the things that you're going to want to do is pay attention to the meridian line. So when objects are close to the meridian line, they're at their highest in the sky. And their highest in the sky means that you're seeing them the most clearly. And so for the next couple of nights before the moon gets too bright in our sky, I'm suggesting that folks maybe take a look at some of the northerly galaxies. I did mention a couple of these in the current issue of Sky News magazine. Uh, one of them is the NGC 4725. So let's bring this one up here. So Coma is already starting to set, you know, down into the western sky, but it's still relatively bright, relatively high at 11 p.m. So call, this uh, galaxy NGC 4725, it's actually the brightest non-Messier galaxy in Coma. So once, you, once you're clear with the Messiers and you want to try something new, have a, have a look at this one. It's um, This magnitude reported here in Stellarium of 12.44 is incorrect. It's actually magnitude 9.4. So if you've downloaded the more recent versions of Stellarium, these errors have been corrected in some of these deep sky galaxies. But um, I'm using an older version and it reports an incorrect uh, magnitude. Another one you can go for is the whale. So the whale galaxy is nearby. That's the one that has the, the little um, associated galaxy that looks like the spouting whale. And then of course, in the same telescope view, you can look for the hockey stick or crowbar galaxy kind of right nearby, just to the south of it, celestial south of it. And then last up, if you're gonna look, well, look for a really nice galaxy, you can look for the cocoon galaxy. Here, where's my cocoon galaxy? It's up here in Canis Venatici. Here we go. Here's the cocoon. So the cocoon galaxy is easy to find. If you find the constellation of Canis Venatici, the two stars, so Cor Corolla is a double and then Chara, just take that line and just extend it by another half degree, just the moon's diameter. And you get this nice uh, two in the view, two for one galaxies. Um, the one galaxy is gravitationally distorting the larger galaxy. So this is actually an ARP, uh, one of ARP's um, peculiar galaxies, NGC 4490, so this has the cocoon. Then um, what I suggested we do at the next dark sky, so we're, we're kind of done with galaxies for the year. So what we can do is head on into um, something in later in the month, so in early July, somewhere around, you know, after the 20th when the sky is nice and dark. So maybe spend some time looking at, at uh, constellation of the herdsman, Bootes, and um, one of the things that they've got in here, we don't have any uh, Messier objects in this uh, constellation, but we do have um, nearby Messier. So we've got um, the pinwheel just up here in Ursa Major. We've got the M102 spindle galaxy up near Draco. And then we've got M3 in the neighborhood just in next door, Canis Venatici. Uh, but in terms of deep sky objects, Bootes has this great snow globe cluster. The snow globe cluster is... Um, Kind of a small on the smaller side of globular clusters, but it's a uh, it's actually one of the fine Rask's finest NGC objects. So it's magnitude nine point seven or so, and it you'll find that it's not very uh, dense. So you know it's uh, not as kind of magnificent as uh, you know M thirteen would be in Hercules. And then it's got Bootes. The herdsman has a really nice galaxy down here in the corner. This is a, not a Messier, but it's a Caldwell object. NGC 5248, 
It's a really pretty spiral galaxy. And there's so much activity going on in the spiral arms that you can really, if you've got a larger telescope and darker skies, you can look for some, you know, structure in the eyepiece. And of course, in imaging, um, it's a great target as well. Uh, one of the neat things is if you are planning to image this galaxy is note that it's got these um, terrific extensions to the spiral arms that stretch far beyond the, the bright core. And so you can really pick up some really nice uh, image when you, uh, when you go after that one. Uh, just a few more things to look at in Bootes. It's full of uh, terrific double stars. So there's the star Izar, which is a great um, star for backyard telescopes. Then you can head on up to Theba, Theba which is Delta Bootes. It's an easy double. It's a wide double. Then in that area, we're going to get into, where's my... Acalorops. Uh, Where's my Acalorops here? here we go. Acalorops is a terrific star because it's actually an easy double, um, just almost binoculars, uh, almost naked eye, but binoculars. And then in a telescope, the secondary star splits. So you've got actually a triple in the view. And then near to that, we've got a little bit to the north, is the nice pair, nice wide pair of new one and new two Bootes, which are different colors, similar brightness, but different colors. And then up near the north of the constellation, we've got the donkey. So these three little stars up here near the handle of the tip of the handle of the Big Dipper, they're called the donkeys, Acellus primus, secundus, and tertius. And secundus and tertius, both split into doubles. And these are part of the RASC double star program. So you can see Acellus Secondus is a little bit wider than Tertius. Those are a great one as well. Uh, last up is the star Arbutes, which is a variable star. This one's sitting kind of in the, in the center of the kite, just not too far from Izar. It's a faint, you know, magnitude 10 star kind of a reddish um, M-class star. But this one is a, a Myra type variable star. It ranges between magnitude six and magnitude 13, which is a huge difference over 223 days. And it's currently approaching its peak. So I'll just share with you the light curve for that star. So that's the kind of variability that you get in that star. And I think that's, Oh, the only other thing I was going to mention is that if you just want to head up, head out and look at the constellation, you can look for the kite string. So Bootes has this kite shape. And down here, kind of between the herdsman's legs, you can look for this chain of stars, which are his kite string. And just to finish up here, I'm just going to list you the highlights. So that's a, a summary of the uh, of most interesting events of the month. And you can always capture that uh, on your screen and um, mark your calendars. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Uh, wonderful presentation, as always. Uh, Emma, do we have any questions? Um, we don't have any questions, but we do have one comment coming in from Eric Briggs. The space station is flying over at dusk on Monday. At the moment, we arrived at our observing site for the meteor shower. Fantastic. Great. That's it. Thanks a lot. All right. So then next up, uh, Mehdi Bozore and Claire Gong Minier will be discussing high school astronomy in the digital age. Take it away. Mehdi and I do have a co-presenter co uh, tonight, uh, Claire, and we are going to uh, talk about um, High school astronomy in the digital age. So I'm going to start with some introduction to why did we uh, create the, the, the club. And Claire is going to talk about her experience as a club member for three years now. We are going to uh, quickly present the work uh, of another student, uh, Carla, and then I'll, uh, I'll conclude. So the first question is really why? Where did this uh, idea come from? And uh, actually, Let's go back in time. So 2013, 
Uh, I was um, an amateur astronomer in France a long, long time ago. And uh, in 2013, I decided to do it again with uh, proper hardware this time because when I was in France, all that fancy electronic stuff was absolutely not available. And I had to uh, manually operate my equatorial mount. Let's put it this way. And as you can see on the left, uh, this did trigger some uh, interest for my son. So now the next question was, it's uh, very nice to um, actually be able to see planets and be able to see um, our globular clusters and, and stars in, in your scope. But uh, what about sharing your experience? And that's really what uh, did trigger uh, me to, uh, to get a nice uh, DSR so I could do some imaging and then share with my friends uh, here in Canada and my family back in, uh, back in France. So that was a successful operation, but really, what I really uh, like to see was, um, and is still, uh, galaxies and uh, deep sky objects. So I did switch to uh, an equatorial mount in uh, 2014. And uh, as you can see, I also got uh, a nice uh, uh, guiding scope and all the uh, associated hardware. So this time I was ready for uh, deep sky objects. And it was pretty cool, but I mean, Toronto is Toronto and the light pollution is not uh, that great. And uh, the next step was, okay, let's be really serious. So I spent one year trying to find a dark uh, site uh, not too far from Toronto where internet was available and of course electricity as well. And it took me something like one year to find it. And I found it in 2015. And it's really an incredible site. You can see on the um, uh, right picture the Milky Way as I can see it when I uh, when I arrive uh, Friday night. It's quite uh, fantastic. So I moved all my hardware there and I started to do some picture. Again, um, summer is nice. It's not too cold, but uh, you have to deal with like high humidity and very short nights, which is not, not good at all for imaging. And of course, all our friends like uh, black flies, mosquitoes and wasps and everything. So winter is way, way better for that. And that's my uh, son again. So what do you get from this um, uh, site? So here are some uh, pictures I took. Uh, so yes, it was totally worth it. So you can see from top left um, uh, to bottom right, M64, M13, the Leo triplet. M51, uh, M1, absolutely wonderful, and M101. And of course, we also do planets, even if dark side is not needed for that, but I moved the hardware and uh, I was a bit lazy to uh, move it back and forth between uh, Toronto and actually it's close to uh, Bancroft. So Venus, Uranus, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and uh, Mars, pretty cool. Now, how did we start the, the club? So that's a uh, pretty cool experience, but the takeaway from this experience is really that in order to enjoy, or at least for me to fully enjoy um, amateur astronomy again, the, the, the part of sharing my experience was absolutely key. So I tried to uh, actually uh, do it again, but uh, at school, and everything started with uh, lots of uh, communication presentations. And for one big reason, because I uh, I knew the um, I still know the um, uh, physics teacher pretty well, so he invited me many times to uh, present the uh, potential activities of the club, talk about astronomy, the solar system, and every single time linking it to the uh, actual program, either in physics or mathematics, because we talked about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, even quantum computing at some points. And there was one um, one thing that was very uh, special about um, the, the story around those presentations. It was really uh, it has to be science driven and rooted in uh, in physics. So lots of presentations. <clears throat> we um, what the kids uh, actually kids and teenagers really enjoyed was uh, there was. Um, a physics week at some point, and I brought all my hardware from, from up north at the school. And if I remember well, I also did borrow the uh, solar scope from uh, Rask, Rask Toronto, and there was a gigantic lineup um, at the school for basically kids from like grade 2 to 12 who were willing to, uh, to see the sun. Uh, so that was lots of fun. But again, it's the, the idea of being able to share something is, uh, is there. And um, I did try something that uh, at the end of the day, 
was a small version or short version of the club. And that was a Pix Insight uh, boot camp during um, like a one week vacation at the school. And finally, I did create the club. So I went through like multiple iterations. The first one, okay, so I have one slide that is pre pandemic, and then um, another slide that is pandemic time. And hopefully, I'll be able to add very soon the third one post pandemic. But pre pandemic, um, we changed the, uh, the format many times. The first uh, iteration was uh, classroom only uh, Friday afternoon. So that was really cool for interactivity, but um, you just can't really do uh, astro astrophotography for real. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, pretty good, pretty cool to play with, uh, let's say, robots or we played with a drone and did some programming at some points. But the, um, the students basically were not able to bring something really cool back home. And, and that was, at least from my point of view, one thing I really wanted to fix. So iteration number two was, OK, classroom, all the interactive and cool stuff. And then Zoom sessions um, on Sunday, Sunday night, actually, it was. And uh, <clears throat> the Pix Insight license uh, got included in the club. So the club at the Lycée Francais is uh, like all the other clubs. It's a paid club. So that, that did allow me to actually spend some money in Pix Insight licenses and, and other uh, software. Um, so iteration two, uh, we had two groups, uh, beginners, uh, mostly classroom and advanced on a Zoom session uh, that was really, really uh, science oriented. This, uh, in this iteration, I had a, a cohort of uh, grade 12 actually who really wanted to get their hands dirty, uh, see equations, solve equations. So that was really interesting. Then iteration three, that was uh, classroom plus Zoom session. And I did split the Zoom sessions in two, uh, two groups, basically one more junior and one advanced uh, group or uh, students who had a chance to play with Pix Insight uh, for a while uh, and newcomers to uh, Pix Insight. And we did lots of things. Uh, panoramas, Mars Rover is a wonderful target for that. Uh, the ASOs using uh, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope data, that, that's uh, always impressive because of the quality of the data. We also extensively used the uh, eye telescope uh, network. And it's very nice because basically students can learn, OK, what does that mean to plan uh, your imaging session and then uh, execute on it? And then we used real uh, data that I acquired uh, up north and uh, super successful data from the uh, Juno mission, the Juno cam. And it's, it was, and it's still uh, super successful because the, uh, the, the pictures are easy to process. You see a massive difference between what's available as raw data on, on the web and what you can come up with uh, very quickly. And also students can bring the, the, the picture back home, but we also every single time submit the picture for publication on the NASA website. And there's nothing better <laughs> when you're a student to uh, tell your parents, hey, by the way, Look at this NASA website. I have my, my picture on it, so that that's uh, always a very good experience. And we even wrote uh, our yearbook, and not a small one. It was like uh, something like forty pages, if I uh, remember well. Um, and then pandemic time, and that's why the title of this presentation. We went um, full digital, and mainly because, of course, all the clubs got cancelled. Um, we got stuck at home and. I mean, everybody knows the story. How long did it take to adapt? Uh, for us, it took like uh, 10 seconds. Like I just sent an email. OK, club is canceled. Let's uh, let's meet on uh, Sunday night uh, on Zoom. And that was it. Now, that's not the end of the story. How easy was it? Absolutely not easy because first, for the students, when you spend your entire week in front of a screen, um, at the end of the day, you need to be extremely motivated for <laughs> additional screen time. Uh, so, so that's uh, the first point. Second, it, it became a lot more difficult for, for us to publicize the club activities because uh, we were the only club half running in the sense that running online, but uh, not face-to-face, uh, -face, of course. And um, the next question is, how to fit in the extracurricular activities of the school when the policies to cancel 
all of them because of a pandemic. So basically in terms of advertisement, uh, we, we've lost uh, almost everything. And, um, and uh, it was, yeah, quite a difficult time. Uh, club activities today. Um, everything starts with uh, weekly news review, uh, doesn't hurt. And I usually use uh, fees.org or Quantum Magazine uh, for that. And then it's uh, software and data driven. Uh, in terms of software, it's insight, that's a uh, must have. Uh, Telescopius to, uh, to plan uh, any type of imaging session. I usually show uh, the SkyX Pro because that's what I use on my uh, own scope. And of course, Stellarium because it's open source. I, uh, at some point at least, extensively used uh, USGS uh, ISIS uh, software. It's for all image processing um, for planetary missions. The virtual moon atlas is wonderful. Only problem is it runs only on Windows. And same as for uh, auto stacker and PIP for uh, planetary imaging. Now, <clears throat> even if you have peaks in sight and you know how to deal with the uh, uh, data and, and picture and how to process them, the big question is where to get uh, the data and what type of data do we want to get? Like, is it like raw? Is it uh, corrected or something else? So we use uh, MAST, uh, ESO, uh, also PDS for all the um, uh, planetary data, JunoCam, of course, and the two rovers, um, raw uh, data streams. Programming and uh, physics and astronomy, uh, Python, it's a must have. So there's always every year an introduction to a Python in the context of uh, astronomy, physics, and uh, also data science. So we uh, quickly go through Astropide, Pandas, and the, uh, it, the result pack from uh, HST. And we use the uh, Jupyter Notebooks for that because it's uh, so uh, widely adopted that you can find like lots of uh, tutorials and examples online. I also always uh, show GitHub for uh, code sharing, uh, code versioning, and collaboration, uh, basically to give a good introduction of what it means to uh, to do science uh, today in the context of, well, in the academic context or uh, industry context. And uh, Overleaf, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, lots of students uh, did try or get uh, got their hands dirty in uh, LaTeX. So Overleaf is a very nice uh, web interface to make LaTeX easy. And that's what we use to, uh, to uh, write and publish our, uh, your book. And of course, physics and astronomy, your, your preferred book. So now I'm going to stop and uh, Claire is going to talk about her own experience. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Claire and today I, I will be presenting my experience in the astronomy club directed by Mehdi. Uh, I don't have the slides. So I've been a member of this club for three school years now, uh, since September 2019. Uh, I started in grade eight and now I am in grade 10 in the Lycée Français de Toronto. Uh, the three years I was in the astronomy club were during the pandemic. So the classes I know are different from the ones uh, many used to teach uh, pre-pandemic. The first school year I was in the club was from September 2019 to June 2020. Uh, the classes were uh, at school on Fridays, and we also had uh, Zoom meetings on Sunday evening. Uh, however, in March, the lockdown began and we were not able to meet on Fridays. Uh, for the second year, from September 2020 to June 2021, uh, we uh, classes were mostly on Zoom. Uh, and for this year, since September 2021, we only have Zoom meetings. So uh, during the first year, uh, we did a lot of things, but the lockdown caused by Corona made us go on Zoom in March 2020. Uh, on Fridays in person, we did multiple activities where most of the time uh, Mehdi would tell us what had happened during the week and explain some concepts to us from articles. 
Uh, we would also do some, uh, sometimes do other things, uh, like the time he brought a robot and we were able to do a bit of programming on it, or the time he brought a drone and we needed to use an algorithm to move it. Uh, Mehdi also introduced us to Gork Academy, which is an online platform where people can learn coding. He uh, also gave us courses to complete and that we had to finish. Uh, I remember one of the courses being about cryptography uh, and I really liked this activity. And uh, I remember being really invested in finishing the course. During uh, the Zoom sessions on Sundays, uh, we did image processing with PixInsight. The first picture I had ever worked on was uh, the Tadpole Galaxy. Uh, afterwards, we worked on pictures of Jupiter. We took the raw images from JunoCam and improved them. Uh, the other locations where we extracted images uh, from was the Hubble Legacy Archive, uh, which is, yeah, uh, which we still sometimes use now. Uh, and during the Zoom sessions, uh, we also used the Jupyter Notebook, where Medi taught us a bit of programming with Python. Uh, there, he used coding to process pictures uh, instead of PixInsight. Uh, he also explained to us how Python and programming in general could be used in a lot of contexts and also what machine learning was. Uh, at the end of the first year, we had a yearbook with a lot of pictures uh, that we had processed during the year. Uh, and there were also explanations of how we had improved uh, the images, data, and a few other things too. Uh, so here we can also see the robot that he brought uh, on one day in the Fridays. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so during the second year, from 2020 to 2021, we were most of the time online uh, because school was not open. Uh, for most of the meetings, uh, Mehdi ran us through what had happened during the week, and then during the rest of the hour, we would process pictures with Pix Insight, and etc. Uh, he Therefore, uh, we did a lot of pro image processing this year. We also started using uh, Telescopius and iTelescope, uh, and Telescopius allows the user to explore the sky. And yeah, and iTelescope is a group of telescopes all around the world that you can rent for a certain moment and take a picture of any object in the sky. Uh, we use those two sites to try uh, to take pictures of the planet Mars and also a picture of uh, the Horsehead Nebula uh, that we can see here. Uh, we then used Python and AstroPy uh, with many tutorial uh, of on GitHub, uh, which yeah we yeah uh, we also took uh, data from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope of the Horsehead Nebula and then we processed it uh, the picture using PixInsight. Uh, we also did a, a bit of astrophysics and astrophysics uh, on the Big Bang and other things such as. Uh, just like the picture that was here previously. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's the Horsehead Nebula, uh, the um, data that we took, uh, the image that we uh, that comes from the Hubble Space Telescope and that we processed using Peace Insight. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so during the third year, uh, we did uh, we did less things, uh, but it was also really fun. Uh, we did not go back to real person learning and we just continued with the Zoom meetings. Uh, we still had the same schedule uh, for the Sunday evenings where Mehdi would explain some concepts or describe what had happened during the week and we would do a bit of image processing with Peace Inside after. Uh, during this year, we also got the membership for RASC and with it, we participated with in the Sky News competition. Uh, and here are some of the pictures that we did for the competition. The next slide, please. Uh, so that's for the November uh, one, which was NGC 7338. Uh, next slide, please. So that's uh, the picture from March uh, to April and April, uh, which was M106. Next slide, please. And that was the May, uh, the May uh, picture, and it was uh, for M13, 
and I think you could uh, choose, it's a globular cluster, and I think you could choose between uh, processing M13 and M3. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Tadpole Galaxy, uh, this is uh, the first uh, image that I ever I had ever worked on, uh, and it's um, a galaxy, a disrupted barrel galaxy that's located uh, for uh, 420 million light years away from Earth uh, and in the constellation of Draco. Uh, the galaxy's most distinct feature is its trail of stars that looks like a tadpole tail. The galaxy that we see from our point of view is a lot older than in reality. Uh, indeed, the speed of light is approximately uh, of uh, 300,000 uh, uh, kilometers per, per second. Uh, therefore, the light from the Tadpole galaxy takes 420 million years to reach us. Uh, this picture is thus uh, 420 million years old, which was even before the dinosaurs had appeared on Earth. Uh, they which appeared uh, between 20, uh, for, uh, uh, to 233 years ago. Uh, but then what was on the Earth uh, 420 million years ago? Uh, well, it was between the Silurian period and the Devonian period. In the Silurian period, uh, jellyfish and bonefish developed, uh, as well as plants and insects. And in the Devonian period, uh, which was nicknamed the Age of Fishes. Uh, it was the fish developed uh, because uh, this was the nickname was called because the this period was the period where uh, when fishes uh, reached uh, great diversity. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, my picture that I processed using PixInsight and the picture released by NASA. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I will present my portfolio and some of the pictures I processed during the past three years. So uh, all of those are, uh, most of those are deep sky objects and uh, that comes from the Hubble Legacy Archive and the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, the Mayan object uh, is the result of two colliding galaxies. It is located 400 million light years away and situated in the Ursa Major constellation. Uh, this is the uh, this is M51, which is a set of two galaxies, uh, M51 or the Weyerpool galaxy, and uh, M51b, which is its interacting companion. Next slide, please. Uh, this is part of M16, the Eagle Nebula uh, in the Sagittarius arm. Uh, the pure, uh, this is this is the pillars. Uh, of creation. The galaxy next to it is M4, M104, or the galaxy of the Sombrero. Next slide, please. Uh, the galaxy uh, here is um, NGC, uh, NGC 1300, uh, or uh, which is a barrel ga spiral galaxy located 61 million light years away in the constellation of Eridanus. Uh, here it's the picture that I beca began with uh, using uh, from, that comes from uh, the Hubble Legacy Archive uh, or, yeah. And this is the result. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a picture taken by the iTelescope network and the telescope T14 in particular, which so, it's not from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and this is M31 uh, or the uh, Andromeda Galaxy, uh, which is the nearest large galaxy to the Milky Way. Next slide, please. And finally, those two pictures are planetary and they come from Juno Cam uh, and they are both planets of the, of the planet Jupiter, pictures of the planet Jupiter. Thank you, Claire. So next, I'm going to uh, show you some pictures from uh, Carla, who was not able to, uh, to make it uh, uh, tonight. But essentially, we're talking about the same uh, original data set. So she did the uh, Maya object as well, and the uh, Tadpole Galaxy. Actually, that's the first picture I asked the students to uh, work with. And uh, as you can see, she's extremely good at, uh, at uh, processing 
processing Junocam uh, data. So to um, conclude, um, I mean, what works, what doesn't work, and what's the uh, successful recipe for, for the club? I mean, th there's few things that are absolutely essential. Uh, the first one is support from the school at all levels. Like I, I had like a very good contact with the physics teacher and that was, again, essential. Uh, with the uh, head of school as well. And I got uh, full support uh, because I was able to link actually the activities of the club with the uh, uh, programs at different uh, levels. Support for, from the parents is also, of course, essential. But what is... Um, absolutely needed, at least from my point of view, is uh, dynamic content. So having um, a club that, that looks like a, a course that you can basically can and deliver every year, I found out it was not a great success. But uh, be first, because it doesn't take into account the different cohorts, and they can be like extremely uh, different in terms of interest uh, over the years. And uh, so Having a dynamic dynamic content lets you take into account students' preferences, which is key for success. And uh, and again, the, the study content given uh, so diverse um, cohorts uh, makes it difficult to uh, scale it across the years. Projects are good, but don't always work. It depends on the cohorts. But at the end of the day, any activity, or I should say activities that have a shareable outcome are just a must. Like, students need to be able to go back home or close their laptop and say, hey, let me show you what I did. And that's uh, that's always pretty good. And of course, a bit of competition with the uh, Sky News uh, image editing contest. And that's it. Thank you so much. Do you have any question? Wonderful. Wonderful. Absolutely great. Thank you very much to both of you for the wonderful presentation. Um, Emma, do we have any questions? Um, we do. We have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. First question comes in from Enio. Um, are any of these teacher accessible resources published online anywhere? Oh, yes, we do have our uh, blog. And uh, when I have time, I do publish like every single presentation uh, the same the same week. So I think I'm a bit late these days, but most of the of the presentations are, are available. And I can, yeah, just ping me and I'll send you the link. Great. Thanks. Uh, the next two are comments. The first one comes in from Enio saying, LaTeX, wow. Um, and the second one comes in from Eric Briggs, the Mayall object is a new one to me, which is very okay. cool. Okay, yeah, no, actually, I, I love this one, uh, the Mayall object. It's, uh, it's a really good one. Yeah. Um, the next question comes in from Enio as well. Are any of the meetings archived online? Oh, you mean the um, uh, the sessions themselves? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, so yes, all the sessions are online uh, right now. Great. Um, next question comes in from Chris Vaughn. Did you do any virtual stargazing with students at each of their homes? Uh, I would say yes and no, using uh, Telescopius or Stellarium but like an actual session based on uh, virtual stargazing like uh for real not not really but uh yeah teach me and i make sure <laughs> great um the next question comes in from leo to caf where about is the uh boral three skies that you found oh it's basically just a bit south of uh, Bancroft, like 30 minutes from uh, Bancroft. Great. And um, you, when there's no electricity, it's even darker. Wow. Um, that's it for the questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you again. All right. So our final presentation of the evening is Dennis Gray, who's going to be talking about upgrade options for schmidt kastgren telescopes. Dennis? Hi, uh, Tom. Thanks very much. Uh, good to be with us all again. Um, I'm just uh, um, pleased to be 
with you with this presentation. I had planned to deliver it last month, I ran into some troubles getting it together. I wanted to actually show how things were being put together and how they were being assembled. So I felt that was a good opportunity to uh, uh, bring out one of my classic presentations. So we went and visited the Texas Star Party. Now I'll give you the presentation that I had planned to uh, give originally. Um, so in terms of that uh, uh, essential review, I wanted to first of all talk about my particular schmidt cast Green Telescope, where it fits into the world of schmidt cast Green Telescopes. I'm going to talk about two specific upgrades, uh, the Fast Star Hyperstar upgrade, and also the new uh, dew heater ring from Celestron. So hopefully one or both of these <clears throat> items will pique the interest of our schmidt cast Green owners out there. So first, uh, a question, sort of a little background on my, my SCT. Um, this was my first quote unquote real telescope that I uh, acquired. Um, I had uh, bought a Bosch and Lom 4000, which is also a Smith Cassegrain telescope. However, um, few shall speak its name. It was a terrible Comet Hunter telescope made in the 80s around uh, the time of the Halley's Comet uh, thing. And it didn't really um, uh, have good optics or anything, but it was a nice introduction to the hobby. So the first real telescope I bought was in around 1993. And I, I was uh, originally part of an eight inch uh, Altima system, which was the astrophotography scope of the day. Um, it was a very good crown, uh, schmidt cast grain crown glass, well figured. It, it, because it was being sold for, as part of to the photography market, it <clears throat> had generally really good optics. And so um, when I realized that the schmidt cast grain, the fork mount wasn't uh, wasn't working out for me. I wanted to keep that scope, so I dismounted it and converted it for occultation use. Um, and it's now mounted on a much lighter, more portable uh, GP mount that runs with uh, EQ mod. So it's got a go-to mount that's able to uh, be picked up and moved uh, as as we want to go. Um, now the use cases for this scope are kind of twofold. One is um, Casual observing, it's still a perfectly good telescope, so I can put it on any um, reasonable mount and I can use it either in F10 or with the, um, I have a F6.3 focal reducer, so I can use it visually for that. Um, these scopes have a 1.25 inch uh, opening, in the visual back at the back, um, but you can get, you know, work it with a two inch eyepiece, so it works as a visual uh, instrument, but its main use these days is for uh, occultation recording. So as most many of you know, I'm uh, interested in occultation, recording asteroid occultations and doing some data analysis. I haven't had very much luck over the past five or seven years, but it doesn't, hasn't stopped me from trying. So um, what we want for occultation recording is the ability to go deep and capture faint stars because um, more, there are way more events available to record if you go below 10th magnitude or 11th magnitude than if you have to stay up at, at 6th or 7th or 8th magnitude. Um, you want it to be portable enough so that you can go remote because sometimes occultations have you have to go to them rather than them coming to you. And it also needs to be photographically fast enough so that you can, when you're recording with uh, the camera on the scope, that you're getting a high enough frame rate per second that you can actually get some useful data. So being able to pull in a star at a rate of four seconds per exposure, that's okay, probably okay if you're if you're trying to take a, a, a picture. But if you're trying to say when did this star get occulted or not, um, it's it's just too granular um, uh, a level for it. So that was an important consideration as well. Um, so the answer to that is in part uh, something called fast star. Now, Fast Star is a, um, an, an interesting sort of configuration. It's only offered by Celestron. It's not something that's offered by Mead and their Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes. And if you look at a sort of a standard Schmidt Cassegrain telescope configuration, the light comes in from the front, uh, going through a, a very lightly figured corrector lens, which, which uh, corrects for some aberrations, hits the uh, mirror at the back. It's another mirror at the top of the tube, which is a little round mirror in the middle of the telescope. And you'll see that kind of mirror also on Max Sutov Castle Green telescopes as well. And then finally, that light goes all the way out, goes through the um, 
into the telescope and then either hits your eye or hits the diagonal, depending. So essentially, this is a, a two reflection model, one, two, boing, boing, before it hits you. And um, that's uh, a fairly slow configuration in terms of its setup. And the uh, reason we do this, of course, is to reduce the total length of the telescope. You could do the same thing if the telescope was three times larger, and then you would basically have a Newtonian reflector uh, type of uh, telescope. But that's, uh, that would make it much larger and harder to carry around, harder to mount, and so forth. That's why Schmidt cast screens became very popular when they were introduced. Now, the Fast Star system essentially removes that secondary mirror. It, it completely, you take that mirror out of the Schmidt cast screen telescope, leaving you with just one reflection. So it comes in through the corrector lens, hits one mirror, comes back up here, and then it goes through a fast star lens, which sorts it out and flattens it, and then presents it to the camera, which is going to be up here, roughly where my cursor is. See it up there, that's where the camera goes. So the end of the telescope is not used. So where you would normally put a diagonal or an eye, you just don't even use that at all. And all of the business happens at the front of the telescope. That's the, the, the nature of the fast star system. Um, now, where this um, comes in, how this impacts occultations is tremendous um, benefit for me in the sense that the field of view that you get from the same telescope without changing the, you know, the, the, the telescope is basically going from this small box, which is basically just big enough to capture the trapezium in the middle of M42, to capture, being able to capture almost the entire um, uh, sort of Orion, all of the nebulosity and so forth there can be brought in with the same camera on the same telescope just by using this lens and, re and, and changing it up. So the field of view goes from 0.3 degrees up to uh, by 0.2 up to 1.5 to 0.95. It's tw almost 23 times larger in terms of the viewing area, which is which is fantastic because one of the troubling things we have with trying to catch occultations is that sometimes it's very difficult to find the right field. You know, you're looking through a field of stars. Your go-to system isn't quite accurate. You're setting up on the fly, you're in a hurry. It's really helpful to be able to find, um, uh, use more stars to, to track the location of the occultation and zero in on that particular star that you want to try and record. Now, um, there is uh, another thing called hyperstar, which is part of the quote unquote fast star story, but it's not quite the same thing. So fast star and a fast star lens was the original generation lens that was designed to work with the S big camera of the day. This came, was introduced around 1995. And it's, it essentially was working with um, an S big camera at the time, which was basically like a 640 by 480 field of view camera, and it was optimized for that kind of camera. So it's a very small field of view, uh, but it introduced the fast star system. And you can still buy that on the used market, but the one that's sort of in use today is the one that's called Hyperstar. Now Hyperstar, essentially what happened here was Celestron wasn't happy with how well these things were selling, um, and, and a company called Starzona out of Phoenix came to them and said, well, we'd like to license the technology from you and do our own thing. And what they've done is they've created something they call Hyperstar. And Hyperstar is basically a next gen version of this. Um, it's got a, a larger field of view. It's designed to work with larger cameras, even DSLRs. And um, it includes collimation screws to align the field. And it's got a nice protective case that you're able to put the secondary mirror into and so forth. So I've only been using the Hyperstar, but I do understand that uh, the, the, the old fast star is still there. So what is it you're buying? What is it you're getting? So essentially, you have uh, on the bottom of the, of the Hyperstar lens assembly, you have a thread that's designed to screw into the front of your smith green telescope. So when you take your, um, your old, your mirror out, you're left with a little threaded ring there where the mirror used to be and the, the lens bottom screws straight into that. The top part of the lens here is where you put your camera. So that is a standard 
uh, what's called an M42 thread. And the M42 thread works with all kinds of different adapters to connect various kinds of cameras. In my case, I'm able to thread directly onto the Hyperstar with my camera. But if I was using a DSLR, if I just had a T-ring, I could put the T-ring on this Hyperstar and snap the camera into it and it would work. And then the other thing that comes with it is there's these uh, collimation screws. They're a combination of push and pull. So if you're working with your um, Hyperstar and you want to really and you find your field isn't flat, you've got some stars out of out of whack in this corner and other stars that are there, you can adjust uh, the field of view. And because even though it's a round system, when you screw it into place, it always tends to lock in the same location. So if you adjust those collimation screws for a specific telescope, it should continue to work that way as you go forward. So very well made piece of kit, um, fairly high quality, hefty, made of aluminum and uh, other good materials, and about $1,000 or so to, to purchase purchase one of these. So I'm sorry that's the bad news in this presentation. If I was getting you excited, maybe I've just unexcited you. So how do you go about installing it? It sounds kind of scary. You're putting this thing in the front of your telescope. Well, it does look scary, but it's actually not that bad. So um, if you start with your uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope, there's a retaining ring, which is uh, the uh, surface that's used to maintain uh, the keep the secondary mirror in place so you don't just gently unscrew that with your hand. There is a little tiny um, knob on the back of the, sh of the secondary mirror and you simply lift the secondary mirror out as I've done here in step two and you can see that's the mirrored surface there. You, you uh, take that and immediately uh, plop it into the uh, Hyperstar case to keep the mirror clean and keep dust off of it. Um, and as soon as you've done that, then you're ready to actually put the Hyperstar in. So then the Hyperstar assembly is um, dropped in and screwed in place of the uh, where the um, secondary mirror used to go. And then the final step is that you add the camera. And in this case, I just um, screw the camera onto the lens. And then I get the, this uh, configuration here with my uh, uh, Hyperstar um, in on. Uh, connected to the correcting plate. So I've got my correcting plate, I've got my uh, fast star interface, the hyper star there and the camera there. And all I need to do now is to connect my camera to my computer and I'm ready to, to start work uh, with my uh, hyper star. So overall, this has been a real, um, uh, real improvement in terms of what I'm able to do for occultation work. Um, I did notice it's kind of, you know, kind of cool though that you have this, this know, uh, gear that you're able to stick on the top of your, your instrument there. But the results that I'm seeing are pretty, pretty good here. So this is a frame from um, an occultation attempt that I did in um, April. Um, the attempt was a success. Uh, the asteroid chose not to show up. Um, but what you can see here is, first of all, I'm getting a pretty wide field of view here and also um, how deep I'm able to go. So I'm able to clearly see 10.6, uh, 10.8 magnitude stars here in this field. And I think I could probably um, convince myself that I could even go a little fainter than that. And this is one eighth of a second exposure uh, with appropriate gain settings and so forth on my camera. So I'm really pleased with how well that's working and how well it's able to uh, help me um, get to that level. So with some confidence and knowing that I can get to 10.8 magnitude, that allows me to expand my uh, available search space for occultation opportunities, which hopefully will allow me to actually uh, have a successful one someday and stop, uh, start getting some science and, and, spending, uh, and spending less time on the equipment. But while we wait for that to happen, we spend time on the equipment. So, one thing I should mention as well is that um, there are improvements coming and have been coming through Starazona to this um, particular technology. So the one I have is the version 3, uh, which is designed to work with a, an 8-inch Cassegrain that runs at f2.1 for photography folks there, uh, reducing my 2,000 millimeter um, telescope down to 425 millimeter focal length. Uh, with a, a large image circle and a maximum field of view of 3.8 degrees. So um, there is a version 4 out now, which is the one they're selling, uh, which is f1.9, takes the focal length down even further, 
and increases the field of view significantly as well. So it's good to see that uh, even though this is something I would consider to be sort of a niche product in the sense that not everyone's going to want to spend a thousand dollars for this particular combination of telescope and telescope equipment, it's good to see that the manufacturer is still supporting it, still making new versions, and uh, that's encouraging. Um, there's a lot of, of, of opportunities in the aftermarket for Schmidt cast screen telescopes. They're one of the most popular models in the world, so uh, this is one one reason why this accessory uh, kind of exists. If you put it that way. So this is. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a moment because I'm going to move on to another topic now and just see if there are any any quick questions uh, before we move on to the next topic in my presentation. And uh, Emma, are there any questions? Um, we got a couple of comments and one question. Um, Eric Briggs says, "I hope I can do another asteroid occultation soon." And that I've been using Fastar for almost 20 years. It's very good, but it's time for an upgrade. Mm, cool, cool. Good for you, Eric. If you want to give, uh, if you're in Toronto and you want to uh, come by and have a look at it, you're welcome to. Eric also asks. Uh, well, he says, "Congratulations, Dennis. Was this a successful miss?" It was a successful miss. I, I got on. I got on station. I got found the right star. I confirmed the right star. I had everything up and running. I even had 30 minutes to make, make tea. It was good. It was a good one. It was a very low probability, though. It was like one of these ones. It's like I was not at all surprised that it was a miss because I think I had about a 5% chance. But if I had found it, wouldn't that have been awesome? That's great. We actually got a couple more questions that just came in. Um, Chris Vaughn wants to know, how do you collimate? Um, you're basically uh, looking at your your field and you're you're looking for if I go back here um, you're looking for problems in the edges of the field here so um, uh, if you took a longer exposure and if you saw that things were sort of smooshed out that way and that things were starting to become comet like when they weren't comets then you could adjust it there and take some uh, additional exposures so I think it's a, an iterative kind of process um, uh, you, can, you can try collimation tools as well. I think that would work, and they are supposed to work with um, Fast Star as well. But um, that would probably be the, the kind of collimation one would want to do. Hope that answered the question. I haven't had a chance to do it myself. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, this next question comes in from Eric Briggs. Thuringia? Thuringia. I don't know what that means, um, but that's what he wrote. Is that, oh, is that a question about which, it, which application it was? Oh, possibly. It was UB244, I think. Uh, I'd have to look it up. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, reasonably bright star at 11, 11 o'clock at night. It was pretty good as these things go. All right, I'm just going to carry on then. Uh, we can, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, get more questions at the end. And, and I'm just showing here the, the, the uh, tool case that the whole kit and caboodle fits into, and the Hyperstar, I have a, a plastic case that I put the whole thing into, and it just tucks right in the, into the tool case beside the SCT, creating a nice compact and very portable uh, system for me there. All right, the other thing I wanted to tell you about was uh, do, he do heater rings for Schmidt cast ring telescopes. So um, for those of you who are kind of new, um, uh, do control is something that astronomers are often um, very, very interested in. Often the best nights for observing often have um, the attribute where there's high humidity and when the temperature drops at night, you can get dew forming on everything, including on your optics. And as soon as that happens, your, your, your observing session is basically toast because everything goes blurry and out of focus and that's uh, very hard to recover from. So um, there's two major ways of dealing with this. Uh, one is to, um, you know, essentially take out a hairdryer and blast your telescope. That's not easy to do, and you need power source for the hairdryer and yada, yada, yada. Uh, or to work with uh, dew heater strips. So dew heater strips are, uh, you know, usually Velcro strips that are wrapped around certain parts of your kit. And you apply some power to those strips to heat them up just enough to prevent dew formation while not affecting your observing. So you don't make them super hot because you don't want them to overheat. 
um, but you um, often have a dew controller which has sort of temperature and dew point sensors which turns them on at the right time and tries to make sure that the optics are kept just warm enough that the dew will go somewhere else basically. So when everything's working properly and you're using the dew control system, uh, your optics will stay uh, dew free. The telescope itself and you may get wet but the telescope and its optics stay free, and that's that's the goal. Now, dew heater straps have been sort of the gold standard in this industry forever and ever. Um, they were popularized um, back in the early 80s by Jim Kendrick of Kendrick Astro Instruments. And Jim um, basically um, took this design, which had been talked about by amateurs for years, uh, which is basically putting a, a series of resistors into a, um, a Velcro or into a strap and then using Velcro to attach it. And, and he basically turned it into a commercial product. Uh, it uses an RCA style plug for the, <coughs> the power connection. And that's become a, a universal standard that's used all over the world. And um, he's still out there, still making them. You can still buy his dew heating products and I recommend them for a lot of different uses. Um, and uh, so certainly uh, that has been the way that it's been going. However, there's a new uh, thing on the market, which is a dew heater ring. So as opposed to the, uh, the strap that you would use for a Smith cast screen telescope, which is about 26 inches long and has to be wrapped around to get uh, the whole thing, and it can get caught on other equipment and so forth, um, they have Celestron's introduced these dew heater rings, which are precisely designed to fit into their SCTs, five, six, eight, nine and a quarter, 11 and 14 inch, all available. And the heat is applied directly to the corrector plate in front of the Schmidt Cassegrain telescope instead of through the telescope from tube from the outside. So when you're putting a dew strap around a Schmidt Cassegrain, the, the strap goes around the outside as close to the corrector plate as you can get it. And it's supposed to warm it up just directly through there and then transfer to the glass. And so it's not super duper efficient, but these dew heater rings actually go straight onto um, the correct, the uh, original ring that's there. So this is a picture of one of them here. And you can see, essentially we have the plastic ring, which is the, um, the actual replacement ring for the telescope. And then there's just this little uh, brown or yellow band, that's the heating strip that goes around uh, the ring there. That's that's what you're you're getting. And it's using the same RCA standard plug that all dew heating uh, equipment uses. And it also includes an optional cable, which is designed to work with a proprietary Celestron dew controller. So Celestron's also offering, in addition to the dew heating rings, a proprietary dew heating controller, which is advertised as sending just enough um, heat to the dew heating ring to keep your optics clean. Um, so that's uh, that's the kit, and both parts are sold uh, are sold separately. So in terms of the installation, it went pretty well, with one glaring exception. So the first step was to remove the retaining ring, so that came off fairly easily. Uh, they provided this nice white sheet of paper to help protect your optics while you're working on uh, removing the, uh, the ring. And I felt that was uh, quite appreciated. Um, then you align it with the mounting holes. And then you can see here I'm using a uh, fine Allen key to reinsert the screws and put the, the, the new heating ring in place. Now there is a, a problem I ran into during the installation, which is that um, and this is actually on the Celestron website, uh, which basically says that the older models of their Schmidt cast screen telescopes are not compatible with this system. I wish I had read that before I bought it. However, I did not. So uh, I, I carried on as well as I could. But if you have an older style of Schmidt cast screen telescope like this one with that aluminum handle at the bottom or this old, even older style, which is the ribbed, um, uh, one which is the cast aluminum uh, bottom, they are supposedly not compatible with this system. So buyer beware there if you have an older Schmidt cast screen like me. Um, so my experience was, you know, I tried it and the mounting holes aligned well, aligned perfectly well, no problem with the installation. But the issue that actually I encountered was this um, area here, where the wires go into the ring, um, 
they they kind of stick up and they hug the edge of the of the telescope tube very tightly, which effectively prevented the telescope cover or the the cover for that from fitting over those cables. That was the issue that I ran into. Um, so it wasn't that they I couldn't install the dew heating ring. I could. It wasn't a problem. It was the problem was putting my telescope cover back on once those rings were there because of these things sticking out. So. Um, I basically, uh, my guy uh, decided, okay, I'm going to be bold here and I'm going to cut some holes. So I, I marked the area that was having the problem, which was about six inches of, of uh, diameter or, or, or not diameter, circumference, uh, had that particular problem. And uh, I basically trimmed the telescope cover to fit. So you can see here I've cut out the edge of the telescope cover just enough to allow it to bypass or to sit on top of those um, wires and their the wire attachment points there. And when I did that, the telescope cover fit very nicely. So I was pretty pleased with it. Um, so the uh, installation when it's complete looks like this. There is this um, little um, dingus that you is included with, which allows you to sort of pull your cables out of and keep and bring them uh, back away from your, your telescope. Um, and when you're uh, working with putting a dew uh, cap on it, uh, that will uh, make sure that that is there. That's kind of optional. You don't have to use that, um, but that is an option that's available to you when you're working. Okay, so hopefully that made sense to everybody. We can go back over these pictures if there's questions. Um, here we go. Um, and then this is just a final picture here of the installed items. So I'm ignoring here the um, control cable. This cable is the cable for the Celestron proprietary controller. This is the one that's going to my RCA plug, so it's ready to go. And as a bonus, I got an upgrade on my telescope. I got new Starbright XLT coatings, which I thought was which I thought was pretty cool. And that's, that's that story. So it's um, nice, elegant. I was able to install it despite the fact that my telescope was a bit too old. And uh, I enjoyed uh, having one less thing to worry about when I'm in the field in terms of getting set up quickly. Um, and uh, this is, as I said, available for all um, popular sizes of Celestron uh, SCTs. So there you go. That's my second part of my presentation. Sounds great, Dennis. Looks wonderful. Uh, Emma, any more questions for Dennis? Yes. So um, this first question is about the uh, first presentation. Um, it comes in from Leo2CAF. Can you use other cameras with it? Yes. Um, basically, anything that will fit on an M42 um, thread, or you can adapt to an M42 thread, can go on. Uh, so. My particular camera there is just one camera that I could have used. Um, it's I've seen people use it with DSLRs. I've seen people use it with other um, cameras like SBIG and so on. Obviously, because you have the camera in the way, um, you want the profile of the camera to be smaller if you can, just so that you're not obstructing um, the uh, SCT's light path uh, too much. Um, but I find for occultation work, it's a nice trade-off. The camera I have, it's a little bit bigger, just a tiny bit bigger than the central obstruction, so I'm kind of getting a little less light throughput, but it mostly doesn't get in the way. Great. Um, this next question is also about the first presentation. Do you use any LP filters with the Hyperstar? Not at the moment, um, but uh, there are filter drawers and filter um, um, accessories one could add. So I could put um, a filter wheel or a filter or a single filter in that light path between the camera and the fast star and just uh, refocus it if I wanted to. But for occultation work, that's not really required. I, I'm just doing black and white kind of work. Um, but if I wanted to get into that, I could certainly do it. Um, sorry, they also wanted to know, does that cause any aberrations due to a fast optical train? I don't know. Um, Again, like, like because I'm recording these for winking in and winking out 
kinds of things. I mean, it looks to me as though I would get good pictures from it if I wanted to take good pictures with it, but that would be more more effort. I should try it and give it a whirl and maybe report back. Um, but up until now, all of my exposures have been ideally less than a second. Um, so I have, and I haven't been trying to stack them or do any kind of a post uh, post processing on them. So I can't really comment too much more than that. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is, uh, shouldn't Celestron, oh, it's about the second presentation, by the way. Shouldn't Celestron consider adding these dew heating rings as a standard part of the new SCT scopes they sell? One would think. Um, it, it really is something that does make one a little nervous in the sense of <laughs> doing this kind of, this stuff should be well be, could be done at the factory, I think. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, on the one hand, I can see that as an aftermarket thing because there's just, you know, tens of thousands of, of these telescopes floating around and people, people will want to upgrade them. Um, and it's also the kind of thing that, you know, you could easily have installed by your local telescope store if you're not comfortable doing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think do heating like some higher end telescopes, like Obsession telescopes and so on. They they include heaters in in you know basically uh, at the factory. The heating element is included, and you just have to plug in um, a heating controller into the telescope, and then the key um, uh, mirrors and and uh, things are kept uh, appropriately heated. It, it, it just feels to me like a, a yeah you. It, I agree. It should probably be included. I mean, somebody who, who um, is observing in Arizona might say, well, I don't need that because I don't have any due in Arizona. But for most of us, it's, it's, it is a problem. And, you know, the reason that I think there's a market for it is that all of us have been out at, at a really great place like Mew Lake in September, and we think we're having a wonderful night. And then the dew closes in on you and you have everything set up and you have a beautiful dark sky and everything's going well and you can't do a darn thing. And I've had that happen to me and it's, it's just the worst feeling because of, you know, uh, once, once the dew sets in and if you can't stop it, you're done. There's nothing you can do really. Okay. Um, lastly, we have a comment coming in from Eric Briggs who says, I'm not sure that's how Starbright XLT works. <laughs> Thank you for catching my little my little joke there, uh, Eric. Much appreciated. <laughs> Great. Well, that's it from questions and comments. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much to all of our presenters this evening. And uh, let's get into some announcements. Then. So, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone who has been watching us live. Uh, we've got two sets of meetings here online on YouTube as part of the RASC Toronto Center. Uh, you've just had one of our recreational astronomy nights, our speakers nights, in which we have a member of the astronomical professional community come in and talk about things, are currently on hold for the summer season. They'll resume in September. Uh, but if you're here for the first time, uh, please use the YouTube chat to say hello, to answer some questions for presenters like other people have been doing. If you're a new member, introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far away, let us know where you're coming from. Our next Recreational Astronomy Night is on the 6th of July, 7.30 p.m., right here on YouTube. Andy Beaton will be discussing the sky this month, and we currently have two empty slots, two additional presentation slots for our next RAM. If you'd like to present something, please contact Paul Markov. Coming up the DDO over the next few weeks, on Saturday, June the 11th, from 9 to 10.30 p.m., Jess McIver will be discussing what can we learn from gravitational waves at DDO speakers, Astronomy Speakers Night. There's a $12.76 uh, registration fee. Links can be found at rasto.ca. On Sunday, June the 12th, from 11 to 12 p.m., our very own Chris Vaughn will be hosting Ask an Astronomer. $5.65 registration fee. Links also at rasto.ca. Coming up on June 17th, DDO Up in the Sky from 9.30 p.m. to 11 p.m., $12.76 registration fee. And DDO Astronomy Summer Stargazing, Sunday stargazing, sorry, on Sunday, June 19th from 1230 to 1 p.m. with a $6.92 registration fee. And like with all the others, links can be found at rasto.ca. 
Coming up towards the end of the month is the Rask General Assembly. Tickets are on sale now. I've already got mine. Uh, do you have yours? Uh, full details and purchasing of tickets are available at raskga2020.ca. So, um, effective the 1st of April, the Toronto Centre restarted outdoor public outreach. Um, we're recommending that volunteers and visitors wear masks. We recommend telescope operators disinfect their eyepieces, their focus knobs, and any other touch points like a step ladder with a 70% rubbing alcohol following each visitor or family unit. We require visitors to disinfect their hands before touching any information booth literature. And when deciding whether or not to participate in events, all members should consider their personal health and comfort first. As for the rest of our operations, no changes at the moment. Our next Millennium Square public stargazing event is this coming Friday, uh, June 3rd, from 7 p.m. to 11.59 p.m. Join us and our sponsor, Durham Skies, for an evening of free public stargazing along the north shore of Lake Ontario at Millennium Square. Uh, you can bring your own telescope. We'll be, happy, we'll be happy to help you set it up and aim it at the moon. Just a reminder that the temperature down by the lake can be a little cooler than away from the lake. Please check our website for a go, no go decision based on the weather before heading to the square. We're back for our observing sessions. Uh, the dark sky star party location is still to be determined, but it's going to be during the first clear night of the week of June 27th to the June 30th. Our first city star party is going to be at Baby Village Park during the first clear night of the week of July 4th to the 7th. Full details are on the website. Also, keep an eye out for our go or no go uh, messages before heading out. The Car Astronomical Observatory, the CAO in up near Blue Mountain, uh, is open. Access to CAO facilities by members or families are only in a non communal fashion. The total site occupancy is limited to 10 bookings and up to 25 individuals. We have one member or family upstairs in the house. The rest are members or families bookings for day use only, not staying overnight, or they're staying in independent campers or RVs or using tents. Full details on the website. Please read everything before you make your bookings. A uh, quick shout out, looking for a few job positions we'd like to fill. The Toronto Centre runs completely on volunteer labour. We're looking for a light pollution committee chair. We're looking for a volunteer committee chair. We're also looking to form a marketing committee, which will require a chair and some members. The AV committee, the folks who work so hard to make these presentations as the success that they are, are always looking for additional help. An education and public outreach committee is looking for additional help, especially online presenters and telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Contact myself at president at rasto.ca if you'd like to help. Brief plug for the benefits of RASC membership. You can renew online at Secure or sign up for the first time at secure.rask.ca. Um, if COVID has thrown things for a loop, the RASC does have an emergency fund. Uh, it also has gift memberships available. For either issue, please contact mempub at rask.ca for full details. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very good night. I'd like to thank our uh, hardworking AV team. I want to thank Andrew and Emma and Betty and Anio for their hard work this evening. And if uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media we've got listed here. Uh, if you like what you've seen, uh, please like and subscribe, hit the notification bell, and uh, remain in the loop. Be safe. Keep looking up. Good night.